Beware of the man who speaks in hands. Really? I find people who speak in sign language to be rather pleasant, actually. Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, where, deep breath, I think I'm finally ready to tackle Undertale again. But overly dramatic game theory voice aside, I gotta be honest with you, I'm scared of this game. So before we begin today's episode, I need to take a moment to level with you all, because it's time I pull back the curtain of the show a bit and address a couple things. Now don't get me wrong, I love this game. I really do, but doing episodes on Undertale have been some of the worst experiences that I've had in the six years of doing this show. The first was Sansa's Nest, a theory I was so excited to share with you. In fact, it was one of, if not my favorite episode that we had done of game theory to date because it allowed me an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite franchises growing up, Earthbound, as well as one of my favorite modern franchises of Undertale. And it was a fun episode. Now don't get me wrong, did I in any way think that this was canon lore to the series? No. Of course not, I didn't think that Sans is actually Ness. But at the end of the day, these are theories meant to get you to think about things from a different perspective. And let's be honest here, there are a lot of similarities between Earthbound and Undertale, okay? From visual design design, to actual sound effects, to even the timelines of the games. But the overwhelming negativity and ridicule that that video got was just... was just crushing. It sucked, man. And don't get me wrong, I have gotten used to dealing with internet hate over the years. I've gotten through the Sonic is Slow controversy, I've had literal petitions written to remove me from the internet for slandering Mario's name by calling him a sociopath, but this one... This one hurt, but it was nothing compared to the next time I talked about Undertale on the channel, when I was selected for the honor of meeting Pope Francis as one of the first 10 digital creators to introduce him to the world of online video. And as part of that, we were expected to give him a gift. So I gave him a copy of Undertale and then made a video talking about that. One, because it was such a huge honor for me, but two, because I was excited to share it with you. This was our achievement as a theorist community, as, as gamers, as online digital creators and people who love online things. And the hate that that video received in the first week. I mean, this was a video where I specifically talk about accepting others and saying no to hating other groups of people, and it got hate. Just, you gotta love the internet sometimes, man. Now, I tend to stay quiet in situations like that, since I've learned that fighting back only seems to make the problem worse. But since I'm talking about Undertale, and since I know all of those comments are going to come flooding back on this video, I figured, let me address some of the misconceptions and errors that were leveled against me when I first released that video. One, I talked to the Pope about cyberbullying in schools. I did not, as many people wrongfully accuse me of, waste his time talking to him about video games or gamer problems. In fact, my entire conversation with the Pope is available on YouTube right now. If you had actually taken a couple minutes to do research before assuming and accusing me of things, would have actually saved me a lot of sleepless nights. Two, the gift of a game was symbolic. Of course the Pope isn't going to play a video game, but three, if you thought that the gift of a video game was bad and had problems with that one, at least it was better than a surfboard, an illegal tree, and a YouTuber's self-written book about themselves. All things that the Pope also received as gifts that day. Which leads me to number four. Yes, obviously other games talked about peaceful solutions before Undertale, but geez, I liked the game, it was recent at the time, and it was the Pope's Year of Mercy. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the word mercy appears a whole heck of a lot in Undertale. And lastly, number five. I was selected via an application that I submitted for this opportunity as a representative of America. America, as a representative of gamers, and of online digital creators. I know a lot of people were upset that I was selected, and I'm sorry if you don't like me. But as someone who tries to advocate for science, logic, and critical thought, I did my best to put a good foot forward for all three of those different categories. And you know what? I did my best. I tried. Anyway, enough of me talking on camera. Let's hop back into the video, because no need to see this on camera anymore. I just thought it was important to talk to you. Mano a mano. 
So as you could probably tell, after those two videos, I wasn't super enthusiastic about tackling Undertale too much. Anyway, in the wake of all the tension going on in the world lately, I played through Undertale again, and was filled with determination to try and do another episode on it. It was the most requested episode you loyal theorists wanted back when the game first came out, and to not cover it felt like just leaving the series unfinished, and I'm not the type to give up. So here we are, back in the ring for round three, to answer everyone's biggest question about the series, who is Gaster? From what I can tell on Reddit, despite all the theorizing in the months after the game's release, it looks like most people ended up throwing in the towel, writing this mysterious character off as some code Toby Fox tossed in at the end of the development of the game to get people speculating, but without ever coming up with a fully fleshed out story of his own. I, however, disagree. After looking at all the evidence from a ton of different sources, in the game itself, in the game's code dug up from places like the Underminer community, from Toby Fox's own statement and my own scientific look at things, I think you can come up with a fairly solid theory of who Gaster is and what happened to him. So no more sins crawling up my back. I present to you my theory on WD Gaster. Part 1, because there's a lot to cover here. And like, seriously, if those opening stories weren't enough to convince you that I would love for this to be a single parter, then I don't know what to tell ya. I know two parters get a ton of hate, and the last thing that I want is more internet shade to be thrown at me on an Undertale video. But I want to give this theory the time and research that it deserves, so just trust me that it has to be two parts for my own sanity and to make this a better viewing experience for you. Because otherwise it would be an under-edited, overly rushed one-part episode where I crammed in everything and didn't do a good job of explaining it all, okay? <sighs> wow, I am unloading all sorts of emotional baggage on this episode. All the stuff that has been weighing on me as a creator for the longest time. Let's start off with the easy stuff to get everyone on the same page, since it's possible that some of you are like, I've played Undertale all the way through three times, neutral, pacifist, and genocide, watched Jack, Felix, and eventually Mark play it, and still have no idea who you're talking about. Well, that's because your chances of running into any evidence of this character in the game is a slim 2.8%. That's right, I did the math. In other words, you could play through the game a hundred times and you'd only find references to Gaster about three of those times. Holy Holy Temmie Flakes, Batman, those are some slim chances. So let's back up for a bit and quickly talk about what we know about this character for sure. The first hints of Gaster came from the River Person, and his now infamous line of Beware the man who speaks in hands. Now obviously this got players more excited than an annoying dog with a stick, since, you know, there's no one in the game who does anything close to speaking in hands, and in a game already full of hidden secrets and vague clues, this appeared to be another big one. So they started digging. What they found were four gray NPCs. Sees. Labeled in the game files as Monster Kid Goner and three G followers or Gaster followers, with dialogue that provides us the only solid information that we have about this missing character. Through their text, we learn that Dr. W.D. Gaster was the royal scientist before Alphys, was responsible for building the core, i.e., the structure that provides magical power to the underground, and that he disappeared after falling into his creation, getting himself scattered across time and space. Although he may not be physically present, he's supposedly always around, since these guys are all super reluctant to discuss him openly. And beyond that, mostly everything else is speculation. There are these mystery man images in the game data that many speculate might be him, but uh, flip this character upside down. Here, you don't have to imagine it, we can do it through the power of editing. And boom! This could also be him. See the face? Just like so many other things in this game, appearances may be deceiving. There's also this wispy white thing that could also also be him, according to online theories, but again, it's all just speculation. GAME SPECULATION! <laughs> So where does all this speculation end up and the theorizing begin? Well, theories are hypotheses supported by evidence, so let's start gathering evidence. Now, whether or not the gray NPCs show up is based on a weird stat programmed into the code called the fun value. Basically, whenever you start a new game, Undertale picks a random number between 1 and 100. Depending on what number you get, different things happen in the game. It keeps things spicy, and also keeps things really similar to FNAF when you come to think about it. Seriously, are we sure that these two fan bases really hate each other? Cause no joke! Between wacky animal hijinks, hidden plot mysteries, random easter eggs, and large quantities of murdered children, the two franchises are a lot more similar than I think people want to admit. Anyway, these gray NPCs show up when the fun value is at 61, 62, 63, or higher than 90. And even if the number is there, they only have a 20% chance of showing up per game! Which is why your chances of ever even seeing them is so low! Even creepier, if you have a fun value of 66, this eerie gray door appears in Waterfall. 
wall. When you walk through it, there's a chance that the mystery man appears. Touch him, and poof! He pieces out faster than a babysitter's boyfriend when the parents come home. And the fun value dictates more than just gaster encounters and secret rooms. When you played Undertale, did you get a call from Sans about your refrigerator running? Or maybe someone called you with a wrong number and then you got a really random song out of it? Or Alfie's called to order some pizza? Well, all of those situations were dictated by your fun value. So why spend all this time talking about fun? Well, because it's the start of the mystery. If there's one thing we know, it's that in the world of Undertale, game mechanics aren't just game mechanics. Toby Fox makes it clear throughout the game that game mechanics make up the very fabric of the game's reality. These aren't just artificial, invisible layers on top of the story for players to use while interacting with the game. These rules, from saving to loading and everything in between, all encompass the actual physical laws of Undertale's universe, much like quantum mechanics and general relativity define ours. Character stats like LVLs or levels of violence, and EXP or execution points in any other game would be numbers relevant only to the player. But in Undertale, they're real, tangible values that characters, most notably Sans, can sense and judge. So if fun is what dictates the appearance or non-appearance of a bunch of these characters connected to Gaster, well, then it behooves us to figure out what fun actually is in the context of the game. And if you are under the mistaken impression that fun is a sense of childlike glee that often comes with playing a game, then you are wrong! You're just wrong! The fun value in Undertale is the embodiment of the very real theory from quantum mechanics known as the Many Worlds Interpretation. It's a favorite of mine here on Game Theory, applicable to everything from the Zelda timeline to the Pokemon universe, so since we've covered it a few times, I'm not gonna go in-depth here. Click the eye icon in the upper right-hand corner to check out those videos where I spend a bit more time explaining it. Long story short, the Many Worlds Interpretation involves the measurement of photons and wave particle duality, but in a nutshell, imagine you're starting a new game of Undertale. You have the option of either going true pacifist or genocide. Now, in that moment, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, it doesn't matter which you choose. If you choose a pacifist run, there's an alternate reality where you went full-on homicidal maniac, and vice versa. All possible realities simultaneously exist. Each time you're presented with an option to either kill or show mercy to a new character, two new timelines are created, one for each option. And this is where we get back to Gaster and his followers. You see, if you find him, Goner Kid speaks the following line. Have you ever thought about a world where everything is exactly the same, except you don't exist? Well, in my first playthrough of the game, that's exactly what happened. A world where he didn't exist. In fact, I must have gotten a really lame fun value since I didn't find anyone mentioning Gaster. No secret rooms. No one even wanted to call me. Truly. I was forever alone. But there are realities where he does exist, and where Sans does pick up the phone to call you. In short, think of each new fun value as another world in the many worlds interpretation. Another timeline. Parallel realities where one small detail is different. Goner Kid does or does not exist. Elfie's does or does not order pizza. So the next time someone tells you to go outside and have some fun, all you really gotta do is create an alternate reality in your own backyard. Simple as that. But not only does this fun value make repeated playthroughs of the game interesting, but it makes a world, pun intended, of difference when it comes to Gaster's storyline. From speaking to the Gaster followers, we know that an experiment went wrong and Gaster was shattered across time and space. Those are some pretty specific words. First, shattered, as in pieces of him went in many different directions. There are multiple pieces of Gaster that now exist. And then there are the operative words of time and space, meaning that these pieces ended up across many different timelines. Lines, the many different worlds, each represented by a different fun value. But what other characters do we know are able to retain memories across multiple different timelines? Only two, Flowey and Sans. Flowey tells us at the end of the genocide run that he's lived hundreds, if not thousands of timelines, doing everything under the sun from being nice to people to torturing them. And in the true pacifist run, Asriel, Flowey's true identity, makes mention of being able to destroy this timeline once and for all. Asriel even says the following lines, Every time you die, your friends forget you a little more. Your life will end here in a world where no one remembers you. It's a really specific thing for Asriel to know, that killing something over and over again will cause the memories of it to fade in everyone's mind. In fact, we may even know someone who he's done this to. 
Goner Kid. Azrael's speech during the final battle is a direct parallel to the same lines we just saw Goner Kid speak a few minutes ago. A world where he no longer exists. The thought terrifies him, almost as though Azrael did this to him to the point where he does no longer exist. Sans, on the other hand, isn't as powerful as Flowey from a time manipulation perspective, but he does bend the laws of space around him, phasing through walls, and during his battle, continually teleports over and over and over again. Though he doesn't show the ability to save or reload like Flowey does, he openly acknowledges that there are other Sanses out there in other realities and tells you to say hello to them. He has tests in place to see if someone is a time traveler. And even though he can't outright control time, he has at least some deeper understanding of timelines being manipulated, as evidenced by his various dialogue options when you fight him over and over during the final genocide battle, sensing how many times he's beaten you. So is it any wonder that the two characters who together manipulate time and space both wield weapons that look like this, and that, at least for Sans, this weapon, according to the sprite files, happens to be called a Gaster Blaster. Or that for Flowey, this is the weapon that he specifically calls out will destroy the timeline. In fact, as you can imagine, there's a lot more to say about the sans flowey gaster connection. But before we do, let's quickly recap. Gaster, the man who speaks in hands in the royal scientist before Alphys, is an entity only known about through his four followers, ones that only appear in certain timelines of the game. These timelines are ultimately dictated by a random fun value. With him being shattered across time and space, he must share some connection with the other two characters that seemingly straddle time and space, Flowey and Sans, and indeed he does in the form of his Gaster Blasters. But there's more, so much more, from the determination experiments to information found in the True Lab, to Toby Fox's Twitter, to the pivotal clue that makes sense of all of this, the word search. No joke. But that's for next time, when we hop into deep lore talk, neuroscientific analysis, and much more to finally reveal the truth behind WD Gaster. So make sure you ring the subscription bell for the notification of when that video is coming out by clicking right here, and you'll be the first to see it. Or just about 10 days from now if you're watching this the day it's uploaded, so it's not that long. You know it's coming, it's not like Doctor Who Part 3, which is existing in this nebulous, non-existent world. There's a final date to this one. And hey, you know what, there's even gonna be a For Honor game theory that's sandwiched in next week to keep you even more entertained, because that's a cool game. It's a fun theory that talks about Vikings, Samurai, and Knights, so that's pretty cool. Look, no one likes a two-parter, least of all me, since it gets everyone to complain about it, but hey, I'm looking out for you guys. But you, you gotta look out for me too. Because you know what? That extra time is going to make the final theory that much better. Alright? So in the meantime, remember, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thank you.